Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural talk of the Math in X talk series. We have Dr. Arga Banerjee here with us today, and he will enlighten us about mathematical modeling and its uses in the study of landscapes. Dr. Banerjee completed his PhD in theoretical physics in 2010 from the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research, after which he was a postdoctoral fellow at IMSC Chennai. He joined ICER Pune in 2015 and his work currently focuses on Himalayan glaciers with a keen emphasis on qualitatively analyzing the co-evolution of the Himalayan landscape. His work has had a significant impact on the study of climate change. The Math in X talk series aims to introduce the BSMS students to the interdisciplinary nature of mathematics by showing how various specialists use mathematical principles in their work. We invite the audience to ask questions during the talk in order to make the session more lively. Without any further ado, uh, Dr. Arga. Thank you so much, and thank you for arranging these talks. I'm slightly feel, you know, feeling bad about people kind of forced to join on a Sunday evening, but I guess you know, that's all right, because there are other things going on. So anyway, so let's get started. So this talk, uh, when I was uh, got this invitation, I was asked to talk about you know maths in art and climate science or in my work in general, but then I thought uh, partly because you know things were becoming too wide, so I did not have a clue what to cover and all. So I thought I would just focus one piece, and choice of this piece is but you know in partly because I do do a little bit of work. I am mainly a glaciologist. I study what you are seeing in front of you. So these two are my colleagues. So I go to these places, do some measurements, and try to understand them using simple physics, maths, chemistry, and uh, so so that's what I do. I'll, I'll talk about that a bit, and then uh, because these glaciers, again, I'll I'll explain how they are also part of the of course landscape, and they are also part of the in some sense they are making the landscape evolve. Okay, so they are the agents which are making landscape evolve. So that way my work you know, naturally extends to some parts of the, some problems related to landscape evolution. And also turns out this semester I'm teaching a course about uh, landscape and their evolution. So I thought, why not maths in landscape? But again, so this is always keep in mind. I, mean, I don't have to tell that to mathematicians. I'll be mostly giving examples which can easily be generalized. Okay, so this is whatever we are talking about. I can bring out, you know, anyone can uh, similar examples from any areas of earth and climate science, and again try to say the same things, you know, convey the same message. Okay, so it's not only about maths in landscape; it's about in, in general, you know, why worry about earth and climate science is about maths in nature, and you'll just be seeing a part of that when we when we discuss. Maybe uh, you know, uh, there are a few introductory slides, and then we'll talk about two small problems. And depending on you know how much time we have and how many how much interaction happens, let's see how much we can cover. Okay. So for example, this landscape that you are looking in, you know, this is Satupan Glacier that we go to. It's in uh, central Himalaya summit and the river Alaknanda, which Alaknanda and Bhagirathi joins together and leads to uh, Ganga, River Ganga, which is uh, of course all of us you know uh, know about. So then this glacier, uh, melt water of this gives rise to. Uh, Alaknanda River, okay, and this place that we are, it's towards the, you know, upper part of the glacier and uh, elevation is 4,000, maybe 600 meters, the place we are in right now, and the wall on your right that you are seeing, that's Peak Chokhamba, it's a Chokhamba Massif, it's called, and that's about, you know, uh, 2.5 kilometer higher than you, so it's right in front of you, 2.5 kilometer high wall, it's, it's really amazing, you know, to be there and uh, all that, but if we think about maths in landscape, so you are seeing that right here, okay? So for example, you are seeing, if you think about these mountains and if all the material that's, you know, uh, lying around, you have to think about how the forces are balanced. So you there, you know, you have to consider the stresses, which are, you know, a bunch of tensors defined every point in space, and they have to satisfy certain property, which is nothing but Newton's law, okay? So, so I mean, so this is what I'll try to emphasize here throughout this talk that the maths in in general probably in earth and climate science that we people use mostly is math that we all of us are independent of you know which you know level of uh, maybe you, 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 some of us are first year students even then basic maths is known to all of us okay so is this being aware that the landscape around us or in general the nature around us you know uh, you can you can look at them as 
as someone has uh, you know said it, uh, landscapes are solutions of mathematical uh, diffusion equations something like that it was said in some context so it's just that you can think of it as solutions of certain equations right and of course these are time evolving so that it's also there and uh, so that's the thing i i need to I, I want to you know convey here that using the elementary math that you know you people mathematicians have learned in your i don't know in class 10th or so still you can look at problems and make it ways using very elementary calculations as long as you are willing to open your eyes and you, you are willing to look at look outside and look at the nature and and try to see what maths you know is operating well okay so that's the main thing i want to convey in this so you know with that i'll start my presentation and as uh, keshava has uh, pointed out please uh, i'll also you know time to time ask you certain question to make it interactive but in between any point of time if you have any question please interrupt okay okay so let's get started so i was talking about landscape or i showing you an image of a glacier and things like that but one problem that you know i i always you know try to emphasize that in in earth and climate science one problem that or one feature of it is that everything is very tightly you know coupled to each other so you cannot really talk about landscape so what i'm showing you is a is a schematic representation of a earth system model you know you can read about that from wikipedia or something or you can look up this particular reference i i i have not read this i, I just took this image from there but generally it shows it shows the complexity that are involved in representing earth in a in a mathematical model that is then you know turned into a numerical program right so you have to worry about chemistry biology physics and there are different components of our system science like atmosphere and you know, cryosphere hydrosphere and the lithosphere and they are you know and landscape is embedded in all this you know mess okay so to understand landscape you may need to depending on what you are looking at you, you may need to look at all these different aspects for example you know there are uh, you know uh, processes for example even the raindrops that are falling on on the on a, on a let's say hill slope it's throwing around uh, grains and these grains are moving preferentially downhill and that when you integrate over a long enough time over geological time scale turns out to be a very important uh, uh, you know agent which changes landscape okay which makes landscape evolve so these are the things one needs to be worried about when solving earth system uh, in any any problem that is related to earth system science okay and in particular here it's about landscape okay so and and the general scheme of things you know it may not be the most general thing but you know uh, something to keep in mind and it's not probably that important also sorry my screen is uh, giving me a bit of problem okay now it's fine okay so basically what we are doing here we are uh, you know uh, just a moment please we are thinking of any any earth system science component you know uh, component of earth system or maybe the whole earth system as a box okay and that box just excuse me for a moment that uh, box is made up of various components and things like that we which we are just you know discussing and then the physics chemistry and maths of all these components are mostly known okay there are certain areas where still work is going on and all that but overall the physics chemistry and maths that we need to know okay they are all known. so that's a that's a good you know uh, happy situation for us but you know we'll, we'll come to that but then uh, and that physics chemistry and maths is in terms of translated into well, let's say either you know uh, a problem or sorry just give me a moment let me check just one second please yeah so it's translated into a magic you know a system uh, or a black box where if you specify the forcing for example in the previous problem you can say what okay, okay if the solar insulation changes which it does you know um, over different time scales so how would the climate system respond so for that you want you may need to run that model and that model as i said it's just you know representation of the physics chemistry and biology and maybe human behavior that we know that you need to translate using mathematics let's say into a computer program and that's where mathematics plays an important role and of course this is you know, all of us know that you know 
uh, we, we express our knowledge of you know, the world in terms of in, write it in language of mathematics and that's what we are doing and that is very very important it is a very practical importance for us you know um, art and climate scientists let's say or if people who are studying landscape let's say where you know, for a given for saying this knowledge this black box allows one to compute the response by that i mean if the conditions change how the landscape change okay and of course to uh, to run this model you may need to uh, not you may you have to do a lot of measurements of various physical variables and because typically we are considering uh, systems which are uh, steady uh, non equilibrium systems there will be fluxes involved so you may need to you know uh, measure some fluxes and so on and so forth so these are the this is the typical structure that we are working on working with and some of us are building these models like you know this black box you know borrowing knowledge of physics chemistry and biology and some of us are trying to computing co compute the response let's say climate is warming up uh, over next to uh, uh, next time by 2100 we know how much or we make a guess how much carbon dioxide we are going to put in and then what would be the temperature change some of us compute that which is called you know forward modeling and some of us on the other hand for example earthquake has happened and you know how much energy has been received where and what is that arrival time of those waves okay those measurements exist and there one may want to understand either the model parameters or the forcing okay what is the actual event you know where a fracture caused this uh, earthquake okay fracture is somewhere in the in earth's crust or uh, crust or lithosphere okay so that is often called uh, inverse uh, model okay so these are the uh, typical things that we are doing in earth science and uh, okay again mathematics does play a central role there and i have already you know told you that you know i hope i am able to convince you that the physics chemistry maths is often uh, or biology is often uh, elementary most more often than not or you know it is there someone one can read up and uh, translate that knowledge to your uh, and write a computer program that you know uh, solve uh, i mean you have that black, black black box ready with you okay but that often does not you know help or lead to uh, issues uh, for example one such problem is a scale issue so what turns out that even let's say uh, for example ask this earthquake example okay uh, to compute what is going on over let's say uh, and how an earthquake is happening in a particular uh, the source of the earthquake let's say it could be a few um, hundreds of square kilometer area and to understand that you may need to have uh, uh, understanding of things that are going on at planetary scale for example plate tectonics right so often in art science uh, things at different scales they matter even if you are trying to understand something at really really small scale i'll give come to an example you may need to understand something that is happening at a very large scale okay as a result the data and computation need data and computation need sometimes explodes and you know you are unable to handle and often there could be situations where because you know these are complicated systems there we may not have available enough available data to run this carefully or data would always have noise and if you are unlucky which often is the case for example there could be non-linearities and things like that in the model so that the model may be sensitive to all these problems you know depending on how noisy the data is how much data you have your result may have very large uncertainties okay so that is the overall scheme that you know we need to keep at the back of our mind so uh, I'll come to an example, but before that, let me ask you. So far, is this uh, all right? Do you have any question or any any um, counter arguments? Anyone? Okay, if not, I move. Okay. So let me give an example. Okay. So this is uh, this is a recent uh, flood in Uttarakhand uh, in Chamoli district, which happened due to a glacier, a very tiny one. It's about you know a couple of hundred meter in this side and maybe few hundred meter in this side. A tiny glacier compared to glaciers, so it's it's le less than one square kilometer. While you know the glaciers that uh, typically we study, the one that I was showing you right at the beginning, that would be ten square kilometer. Okay, Gangotri glacier, when, which gives rise to Vagidati, is uh, hundred square kilometer. Okay, so and these tiny glaciers are the ones which are typically they are high up on the ridge and they have bad access, and because they are small, not much action is happening, so no one studies them. But one such, you know, but they are, they are, you know, a large number of these tiny glaciers are there in the Himalaya or any other glacialized region. So one such glacier 
uh, the volumes are given. This ice volume is given here. It's just a tiny glacier, as I said. It just came down by and along with the glacier bedrock due to a bedrock failure it came down by about three kilometer this whole mass and it turned into liquefied the ice there were enough energy available and on the path there were some other you know snow and ice that was uh, lying there and all of that turned into a huge flood very quickly and within tens of minutes this flood had hit this uh, Rishi Ganga power project and the Stoppelbahn power project and this image if I remember right this is from Rishi Ganga and this is the flood reaching the Rishi Ganga valley I don't know some of you might have seen some videos and images of this I mean it made made a lot of and uh, unfortunately a lot of people uh, were working on these different dams these dams were under construction or under repair and about I think about 200 people died so it was a really devastating flood and it happened just coming up you know source is the small uh, glacier which nobody would study otherwise okay you can read about more in this uh, science paper okay now trying to uh, coming back to this problem like for example an obvious thing is can uh, you know uh, if uh, we predict this like where is the next flood happening where is such one small glacier which may lead to something like this so we know the dam locations the glaciers are mapped and as you can see in these satellite images you know we, we know a lot okay but still it, and and I'll, I'll just show you uh, again um, so this this is the glacier before the event has happened okay this uh, this event had happened i think february 7th okay and this is just two day after the event and you can see the big a big hollow has appeared here because of the glacier the small uh, hanging glacier and the bedrock uh, so all that all of that had come down sliding and that caused this okay and uh, so you can see that uh, we are able to get really high resolution fantastic images these are from satellite data and these satellites are there you know uh, doing their rounds all the time taking photos uh, taking, creating images and we have access to all this data but there are so many satellites and you know there are so many candidate glaciers uh, the region over which these things can happen is so huge that one you know it's very hard to look, uh, identify these events even after they have happened you know it took uh, the community a couple of days to realize what has happened because no one knew what is what is that uh, source and there's a lot of confusion in newspaper and all that okay so after that happened and people looked at the data and there one can clearly see for example this is the glacier that came down here so a couple of years back in 2016 actually a similar avalanche had happened here but luckily that time no bedrock was there and the, the, as a result there were not enough potential energy to turn into, into a flood and also moreover by 2018 a huge crack has appeared so this is the elevation change data sorry i didn't tell you red color is lowering of elevation so this is you know ice got removed from here around 2016 and between 2015 to 18 there's a huge crack that had appeared here and also one can see these areas the glaciers were was bulging up okay it was bulging up and there was some you know we called plane appearing there and this is the you know after the event so clearly there are precursors but now when you look at this image from you know the same image we are looking at this region okay see this is the signal that we are looking for and this is the you know haystack you have to find that you know a needle uh, from so that's where the problem is often you know you have so much of uh, you know uh, data to analyze that to come to a specific conclusion is very very difficult and if you think about this particular event which had happened in this uh, glacier you need to understand the local lithology you know it, it, suppose i mean this can happen anywhere in the himalaya so throughout the himalaya if you are trying to create uh, let's say uh, potentially dangerous uh, glaciers you have to you have to make a map you have to identify all of them you need to think about the this is a map of lithology the rock types and this is only the what is at the surface and for this kind of you know uh, um, problems you need to understand their weak planes the faults and fractures and the vertical uh, layering is very very complex and unknown okay so that is about you know at small scale there is a lot of inhomogeneity okay and 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 this this you know this area is getting forced by this is a map of i i am sure all of you have seen this how india and uh, eurasian eurasian landmass is getting compressed i mean india is uh, going underneath and uh, these are these are the velocity vectors so you can see a lot of strain is accumulating okay and that is happening over a region which is uh, thousands of kilometers wide 
and that is you know in the end uh, directly or indirectly related to this so again and other another important factor here is climate i am showing you the precipitation pattern and of course that's also important here uh, okay so that's where the problem becomes messy and intractable okay so this is where the uh, although the physics chemistry biology may be known there may be some you know incomplete data set but overall the basic physics here is very simple okay as maybe one can think of it as a, you know a block sliding over an inclined plane that's the physics more or less okay but still we, we there is so much of uncertainty in terms of the data we have and the complexity because of the scale different scales are involved so that's what you know although the you know physics chemistry math is known and the mathematics is elementary and you can, can translate that into a nice computer program which could even be efficient but the but the scale over which you need to need to have information and need to run these models that often defeats us okay so i'll now move to two problems okay so i'll, I'll just solve two problems related to uh, uh, landscape you know uh, evolution and landscape and its evolution and the problem one is where is the where are the maxima in arts topography so uh, i i i would you know first uh, i had written down where are all the mountain peaks and what are their heights but then i thought because there's a bunch of mathematicians so maybe maxima is the you know, is the way to write but let me quickly check if people are around and they're listening to my talk i don't know did i lose all my audience because i am not hearing any sound at all okay some people are there good okay so let's get back to the presentation and let's solve this problem one okay so there are two couple of things we want to you know um, do here one is to find out where are the local you know, mountain peaks and let us you know to, uh, to make it more specific let us look at let's say one degree cross one degree area which is about 10 to the power four square kilometer area and in that identify the highest peak and then can we tell you know what are the distribution of these peaks and what are the heights of these peaks okay can we can we predict that and using some elementary mathematics and in particular i have uh, claim that one can do it using you know some simple physics knowledge and some arithmetic so we'll do that okay so before that we look at the topography and of course all of us know this and uh, the what is surprising when you ask that question what is uh, sorry the, I, one thing i didn't say here the scale is only zero to six kilometers so some points are saturated to darkest red and this is the data set and this is a uh, digital elevation model the, the topography z as a function of xy you know which is the topography and then we need to find out this let's say over sorry let's say oh no i need to sorry just a moment this is probably too thin okay need to find out what the what are the where are the maximums but you know what is really interesting that uh, i think some of you would know that all the uh, peaks let's say over uh, 8000 and uh, 7000 meters they're all over here okay the next 10 you know uh, uh, line are some peaks over here uh, Aconcoa, which is below 7000 and there is one denali which is uh, you know below uh, 6000 okay so this is what we will try to understand now okay so to do that let us first try to uh, see if we can set an upper bound on the maximum you know uh, height of the peak that would be allowed so can how to do that so can can someone give me a hint so uh, we have this planet which is let's say solid solid shell okay now we will build a mountain okay and this process will build a mountain out of often uh, tectonic processes but let us say uh, uh, you know some process is building a mountain now the question is what is the height it can go to so how to approach this problem okay so anyone has any suggestion we are trying to find out an upper bound here okay on uh, what could be the highest you know mountain height so if i try start building a mountain uh, range and it's raising and at some point of time you know does it you know ever uh, fail that whole structure does it ever collapse let us think of this simple scenario where you have a elastic material which is you know rock surface of uh, rocky earth 
bedrock and then you create a mountain of any shape you want and in this case the shape is let's say triangular okay and then what controls the height of it the maximum height it can go is it's, it's just the strength of the crust okay any material if you put enough stress on it at some point of time it breaks it could be shear or you know, compression there are modes of failure but uh, it fails okay and then the uh, you know this strength of all these materials that makes up earth crust is known for example if we assume it's granite or something like that typically they can bear, bear a load of about 100 megapascal and then uh, what is the load uh, that this crust has to bear uh, you know, it, it doesn't take any any uh, you know it's just common sense that you all, all agree that this would, should be related to the pressure okay so if this is delta h then it should be related to the pressure. The actual maths is slightly more complicated. You need to solve the force balance, which is you know a bunch of uh, tensors, the stresses, and their derivatives gives you force densities, and then you will have three Newton's law, which you can solve actually for uh, over this domain, and that will give you some stress distribution like this, which tells us that okay, the load maximum load is created here, so just below the surface, okay, and this load is a fraction of this rho h because the load is distributed over a larger area. But anyway, let us not, you know, worry about the factors. So let us assume this and let's see how far we can go. Okay. So it says that on any planet that is made up of similar rocks, one is expecting that the highest elevation in that planet, the highest peak, for example, on Earth, it's Mount Everest or on uh, Mars, it will be, it will be uh, this uh, Olympus Mons. Okay. So, and, uh, so on and so forth. So they, they should be following some such relationship. Okay, there may be a prefactor here we are ignoring, so but that's all right. And then this G we all know is M by R square, there's capital G there which I have not written, and M is like R cube, so G goes as R, right? So that tells us that delta H, let's say over R, and I'll just uh, tell you why am I doing this because it's like R square. Okay? So the fractional, fractional, uh, this thing. Uh, the, the ratio of the highest peak to the radius of this, then should we expecting one over R square. And then let us look at some data because of, you know, uh, from um, astronomers, we have this data. So, and that's how it uh, looks like. So these are different, you know, planetary bodies and uh, the darker colors, they are the silicate bodies, okay? Just like our rocky surface, uh, rocky ones. And the white ones, okay, they are the icy bodies, okay? And one has to be really careful here because when delta H uh, max is comparable to R, then you know you, you are not uh, solving this problem, but you are actually seeing the center of the planet already, right? So this these points let us ignore. But uh, when they are small, when delta H is a small fraction of R, then one see this, you know, in this this is a log log plot, and this is one upon R square behavior which we have, which we had predicted, and these are lines where you take various values of this strength. If the strength would be, you know, 10,000 uh, megapascal, then we expect this line. This is 100 megapascal, and this is 10 megapascal. And turns out ice is weaker than rock, which you would, or one would expect. And that's why these icy bodies, there the topography is smaller. Okay. On the other hand, uh, you have about 10 times larger, uh, strong, higher topography in uh, rocky surfaces. Okay. So just to illustrate this point, that using simple ideas. And you know some simple you know basically dimension analysis one can it can go a long way in getting some approximate answers. Of course, there are deviations from this curve, right? But uh, still, you know, given the effort that we have put in, the reward is quite a bit. Okay, so this is the first result. We and I hope all of you uh, are following what I am saying. Is there any question till now? Okay. So then the next question is, I mean, this is a surprising result. The previous one is a surprising result because it says that our, uh, for Earth, I did not give you the number, the number would be something like eight to nine kilometers, okay? But then why there are so few points which are above eight kilometers? Why there are no other peaks? So what I have done here to, or if we want to go back to that, already discussed this, that, you know, most of the high peaks are only in over this small area. Why is that? Why are not they, you know, more common if the, Crustal strength is uh, crust is strong enough to take the load of uh, eight kilometer. Why is not that so common? Okay, let's try to answer. I mean, it 
the, the discussion that we had it leads to this question so let's now get into try to address that okay so to do that what i have done here i have plotted the maxima and minima just like that you know because the data i had was z as a function of latitude and longitude uh, latitude and longitude okay so i have taken this uh, one degree cross one degree grid and found out the maximum elevation using this digital elevation model that i had and then i have just plotted this uh, maximum peak elevation this is a, these are the local peaks you know this is for example mount everest okay which is at uh, 70 80 degree or so okay uh, uh, so this is the distribution of the peaks as a function of longitude and latitude so okay let me let me give you some hints so let's say if i i am i am at let's say uh, at some value of longitude okay and versus some values of la latitude okay so what is the difference between this uh, this plot in terms of the vertical scatter and what is the implication so at any given latitude band the maximum elevation that are that are observed versus any given longitude band whatever elevation values are observed you know uh, is there any difference that you are seeing now let's say let's say uh, this uh, this elevations this maximum peak elevation did not depend on latitude longitude that's what we expect in the end you know it's a sphere you know, it's totally isotropic and everything and gravity is isotropic tectonic does not care about it although there is a rotation axis but the centrifugal forces are too weak okay so so we would expect this 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 points to be independent of latitude and longitude do do you agree with that varun do you agree with that hey Varun, are you there? Renu, are you there? Okay, finally, Dhiraj has helped me out here. So, but what we are seeing here? Thank you, Renu. Of course, you know, they are, as, we, as we have discussed before, certain regions, for example, this is, you know, uh, high mountain Asia, Tibet and surrounding mountains, this is uh, Southern Andes, this is uh, uh, Alaska, Mount Denali and neighborhood where you have high peaks. But apart from that, the other peaks where, you know, and these are the places where tectonic forces, there are tectonic forces, thank you, Shares. There are tectonic forces which have done something, but other than that, if you look at the background, you see a more or less a wide band. And of course, you know, around minus 30 degree or so, you have this uh, Atlantic, uh, this, you know, so there are no, not much landmass there. So that's why things have come down a bit. But overall, there is a band. And as Shias is pointing out, maximum elevation does not depend on longitude. But clearly here, you more or less up to some scatter, you see, uh, you know, a, a unique curve. You know, look at this region, right? Here, like you know, latitude, long latitude is kind of determining the maximum elevation. Isn't that surprising? Why should that happen? Okay. So, any suggestions? Why is this happening? Come on, mathematicians, physicists, and chemists, and earth scientists. Okay, I knew that, you know, uh, it may be a bit difficult or uh, it may require a bit more thinking. So I'll give you some hints. Okay, let me, let me go full screen now, okay? Okay, so I have, uh, you know, just randomly picked up certain couple of locations, Delhi and Christchurch. The latitude values are 45 degrees south and 30 degrees north. And the uh, mean annual temperature in these two locations are 30 degree and 15 degree. And there is something called lapse rate, temperature from the surface as you go up, because you know this atmosphere is heated from below, and the source is at, the source is below. So as you go up, the temperature increases, uh, sorry, decreases, and the rate is roughly speaking uh, six degree per kilometer. Okay. So now, can someone tell? Uh, you know, does this uh, you know help in any way understanding 
what is going on along this line what is going on along this curve where the maximum elevation is there you know uh, sorry i think i'll have to do that again okay so what is going on along this curve okay maybe this let me leave out this special points over here over here and over here those are outliers we'll come to them in the last part of the talk okay so what is going on over here remember delhi is here okay roughly at uh, sea level it's about 29 or so and here the temperature is 30 degree and Christchurch is somewhere here uh, somewhere here maybe sorry okay or maybe here and there the temperature is 15 degree can someone tell what is happening in this line then over which all the peaks are kind of falling I mean it's an exercise as I said in uh, we have been just been doing multiplication okay let me break it down further you need further hints it seems what is the temperature along this line anyone so if the temperature is 30 degree here what is it at 5 kilometer level somewhere here what is the, if the temperature is 40 uh, sorry 15 degree here what is that at 3 kilometer level somewhere here so the temperature is expected to be lower yes lower than the surface level temperature yes it will go down and this is you know about 5 kilometers so 5 into 6 is 30 right so somewhere here the temperature goes to zero okay so along this line you have slightly negative temperatures okay right do you agree wherever it was oh yes sir yeah so this is in some sense i mean just below this okay this is the snow line distribution in our world okay so here actually it comes down for some reason which is not really related to temperature in the tropics temperature is more or less the same it comes down because there is more snowfall more precipitation near the equator okay so ignore that but it's like something like a cosine function okay which is related to again how solar energy is falling on our surface here it's perpendicular but there there is always a cos latitude angle right so this somehow is making a difference or maybe it's it matters for uh, mountain height so that's the next process you need to incorporate and temperature effect and why would temperature be important because if temperature is below zero then you are expecting a lot of snowfall and glaciers to form so this is kind of telling us giving us a hint that okay uh, uh, this is where the maximum height should be if only crustal if crustal thickness is the only thing but because of snow and glaciers something must be going on that is excluding this area more or less okay and now the upper bound is more or less here i mean this is not upper bound theoretical upper bound this is you know the observed uh, values they, they, there is an envelope and they are always on this side okay so next uh, uh, thing is then to of course and this uh, just uh, one quick uh, uh, thing and this is a paper where they have done the same exercise this is a paper in nature whose main content is just what we have discussed and these are the maximum elevation ignore these points and this is the snow line present but one thing one needs to remember here that the snow line at present is it is, is at its highest elevation because we are in a warm period and our climate you know uh, cools down uh, there are glacials and interglacials and during last glacial maximum temperature the, the snow line was here so over this region the glaciers and are doing you know or above glaciers are doing their things and that is somehow you know reflected in the global pattern of maximum topography that's what and what exact processes are doing that will come to that and before that let us uh, because you know we often go to this kind of landscape so this is a photo from our field which is at uh, maybe uh, close to zero degree isotherm or maybe slightly negative okay these are the elevations we are talking about and just have a look at what's going on here 
So these are some peaks. This is a Satpan glacier that I had shown you. The, for that photo was somewhere upstream. This is at the middle of the glacier. And just to give you an idea of the scale, so this box is you know highlighted here. And this, you know, two, three pixels, black pixels, probably. I don't know if you are able to see it. Do you see you know uh, two parallel lines? Those are two of my colleagues, and they are there. And that's the scale of the landscape. Okay, these peaks are you know few kilometer, every direction few kilometer, and you see huge rock faces, and you see they're all getting broken up. Okay, so you know once you go there and you know this whole story, then you you know I mean it's not difficult to connect these two and understand. Okay, glacial erosion. And the effect of that we are seeing here, all these pieces of rock that are lying there and flowing with the glacier like this, okay, at very slow pace, they are originating from here. Actually, you can see them. These are huge rock falls, you know, ice and rock is coming down. And this is coming because this whole mountain is getting, getting broken apart. And this is what happens when the mountain builds, when they're growing, they touch the snow line, sort of. The snow related erosional processes, they start operating. Okay, and in particular, one important uh, one is periglacial erosion. I think uh, we are not doing very well in time, so I'll skip some of the details. This is a uh, you can look up Anderson and Anderson, which is a very nice book, which where these things are discussed in detail. And this is what uh, you know uh, frost packing is do, uh, doing to ice. So uh, sorry, to rock. So this frost packing is basically there are micro pores inside the rock always. Okay, any rock, any how much solid it is, doesn't matter. There'll always be some porosity and some micro cracks. And water goes there if there is available water, it will go there. And if the temperatures are low, then it starts freezing. And this crack tip starts, uh, you know, accumulating under. They are under stress as the ice crystals are trying to grow, and that expands the crack. And this is a frost cracking process. And this is a laboratory experiment. This is a piece of rock. And what they had done is to attach, you know, the, the temperatures are low here, it's zero, and there is a water supply. And this is similar, you know, mimicking the same conditions. And now we have, uh, you know, acoustic recorders. These are just, you know, record, recording sounds. And you can hear these cracking events. And when you plot them as a function of temperature, you get some plot like this. Okay. You see that the frost tracking is happening uh, at some temperature window. Okay. Uh, is, this, is this part clear to you all? Otherwise, I will repeat. This is kind of important. So can you repeat, sir? Right. Okay. So you see, these are areas where temperatures are below zero. You know, this is that, you know, dotted line we are drawn here. This is the line. Okay. We are somewhere here in this case. Okay. And in, in this landscape, what you would invariably see a lot of broken pieces of rock. So I was trying to, you know, motivate that. When you see something like this, you must know that someone is breaking the rocks apart. And this process is frost cracking. So this is a uh, rock which has undergone frost cracking. And this is a laboratory experiment where you are studying it. But basically what is going on, there are micro cracks. This could be, you know, maybe a couple of hundred microns in size. And then water is there, particularly the as you go deeper inside rock because of geothermal heat, the temperatures would be high and the surface is cold. Okay. So this water inside, they go and get in, into the pore and water crystals, uh, ice crystals as form. And as they grow, if there is enough, you know, water supply and the temperature is cold enough, they open up these cracks a, a bit further, okay? Like that, these cracks, you know, become bigger and the rock disintegrates, okay? And in the previous experiment, it was seen that in that part, for that particular uh, type of rock, uh, which was sandstone, this frost packing is operating around, let's say, minus five degrees centigrade, okay? It's not at zero. So it's not, you know, this freezing process is not happening at zero degree centigrade, but it is happening at minus five degree centigrade. So can someone tell me why is that happening? I hope, I hope this part is clear now. Who had asked the question? Uh, are you satisfied? With my yes, answer? sir. Okay. So where does this minus five degree comes from? I'm sorry, this hint, uh, you know, there is a hint uh, floating around here. It's supposed to have come in the next slide. But now that is there. Does anyone know what is this? Sir, is that the change in yes, melting point with yes, pressure? Yes. So this is a Clausius clapeyron slope, you know, because, you know, ice expands, uh, you know, when it turns into water. 
So as you increase temperature, the melting point goes down. As you increase pressure, the melting point goes goes down. Okay, and that's what we're seeing here because you know to crack, crack you know open this crack, you need we have discussed it before for granite. We would expect some you know this kind of a pressure, so much megapascal. And for uh, sandstone, it may be a bit smaller, maybe 50. I don't know. I'm just uh, writing some random numbers. Okay, and then you divide this by this, you will see you are expecting the freezing to be happening at a lower temperature and this is what is going on and now you know what you are thinking is right you know? okay so again you know again just you know if you know the right numbers and right physics it just takes some uh, multiplication and all to get to get in, get some idea key, okay if your line of thoughts are right or not to calculate exactly when the cracking is happening what, what is their intensity on you may need to solve uh, a more complicated equation in this case that would be heat diffusion equation okay that's not uh, so complicated uh, we know how to solve diffusion problem again as I was telling you more more often than not our uh, maths are elementary diffusion problem was you know uh, Fourier uh, 200 years back maybe uh, roughly uh, shown us how to solve uh, heat diffusion problem using Fourier analysis you can do that easily right so but what it you know is important here to look at your uh, look at here you know in a landscape and see which part of the landscape you know uh, it's telling you what, what is your problem, and where is the solution, and what is the math you require to get to that solution, okay, or maths or physics or biology, okay. So, other thing that we did, I did not talk about is glacial. Is there a question? Sorry, that's probably mistaken. So, what I did not talk about, so this is called periglacial, sorry, periglacial uh, erosion, which is happening around the glacier in the rock cliffs. But also, so this was this head walls that I was showing you the photos of and debris is coming, getting in, mixed into the ice and glaciers are transporting it. And when the ice is melting, the, they, they are finding their way, these debris particles to the surface. And once they are surface, they are just advecting down. So this is all that is going on in a glacier. But also this, as this ice is moving like this, okay, I'll show you uh, in a minute, minute what I mean. They also erode the bedrock. So this glacial and periglacial erosion is the thing that is oper operating very strongly along this band, along this elevation band. And that is what is restricting the mountain height and uh, you know not allowing them to grow up to nine kilometer or so. Okay. So this thing is called glacial batsa. Okay. Glacial batsa hypothesis. So glaciers are acting as a butso and uh, you know chopping off all the mountains and then not letting them grow okay so uh, that's the second effect that you need to worry about when trying to understand where are all the maximum peaks on our world and how high they could be so these are the two important processes and this is again Katavan glacier uh, you know where the first image i had shown you was somewhere here the second one was uh, downstream and this is somewhere in between and this is how it looks like you know, this is all these rocks are uh, derived from these head walls uh, and side walls, and also they are dug up from below, and this glacier is flowing down. And as you can see, this wide valley that is created, you know, so high up and in such rugged landscapes are due to glacier erosion. And that is what, in the end, is preventing these mountains all over the globally uh, reaching the level of uh, nine kilometer. Okay. And uh, just to illustrate this whole thing because the our previous image was a static image was a snapshot so here what we are doing we are looking at one particular glacier very close to k2 k2 is somewhere here sorry my daughter is noisy please uh, bear with me uh, so this i this glacier is flowing down from k2 and uh, this is called paltoro glacier and this image is uh, that we are seeing this small movie you know fraction of a second is consist of nine to ten frames which are shot over 20 years so this and the uh, scale is about 50 kilometer this side and 40 kilometer this side so this glacier flow is a very very slow flow it would it is due to uh, creep of you know ice which is solid uh, uh, material so flow uh, the viscosity is 10 to the power 15 times higher than that of water okay that of ice and that ice is flowing down slowly and doing all these things that you're talking about and you can really clearly see that you know debris uh, rock falls uh, you know and how they're getting advocated and this glacier is essentially working like a conveyor belt and dragging this material down 
and depositing them somewhere here where other forces like water takes uh, care of it okay and also they're eroding the bedrock and that's how they are keeping the mountain height from uh, you know, uh, rising um, too much but now we'll solve try to solve another problem again by doing some you know, uh, simple arithmetic the part that we have left out where are they here so we'll, we'll we have understood you know this nine kilometer limit we have understood why this you know shape is there and now what about these outliers how come they are there how come they could escape the glacial basa so to do that what we had done when we had gone to this glacier we had simply dug holes at various points and found out what is the thickness of the debris at you know hundreds of points in couple of glaciers i'll show you that so this is Chathapan glacier okay and this is Hamta glacier these two glaciers i me and my friends we went there and we uh, measured this uh, debris thickness value okay and then from the satellite data that I was showing you, it's very easy to find out what is the velocity because you know the scale, you know how the various markers like boulders or cracks or a pond, uh, they are moving on glacier surface. So you can track them and figure out what is the velocity. So you have a velocity and you have the width of the glacier, which takes again, you can get from a map. And this is the flux of a material. So if you have a glacier like this, you know, you multiply the debris thickness and uh, velocity and the width okay and you get the flux of material that's going out and of course if you assume you know that uh, this is the head wall and this is the glacier and you can assume roughly you know, approximately that these fluxes are generated from this head wall so if you now also map out this head wall area then you can get a erosion rate again just doing a simple you know arithmetic and of course there are more things to it you're assuming a steady state you need to justify that for that you may need to run a complicated more complicated glacier model where debris transport is also included but not going into all that finally what we are doing what we are done is just uh, you know simple arithmetic and this is the kind of erosion rates we got and from this bunch of glacier two glaciers our data and on other glaciers there are smarter people who did not go and dug hole but they just you know took some satellite images thermal images and analyzed those to find out debris thickness approximately we used all the data that was available at that point of time and this is the thing we got so you see as you know as temperature of the head wall is becoming colder the erosion rate actually is exponentially decreasing okay so although around you know maybe 5000 meters or so glacier erosion is very strong when it comes to very high you know uh, head walls like this one is kumbu glacier which is you know uh, mount everest so there the erosion rates are very very low and that we know because you know as if you the temperatures are very cold then frost packing does not happen because everything is frozen and all the pores are frozen with water so porosity is very low water cannot move around and that's why if some mountain range because of high tectonic uplift is able to cross this high erosion rate barrier you know due to this glacial and periglacial erosion then they have you know a free run then they can grow easily because then the erosion rates are low so this is what we i wanted to you know this problem what we started with we now know that crustal strength versus cavity if you just compare you get the scale okay a length scale which determines how high a mountain can be and then if you consider the effect of erosion particularly glacial and periglacial erosion then you know that there is of course this is not exactly right there is an offset because you know uh, it's hit zero by the time you are at the polar latitudes uh, so it below will go below mean sea level but uh, still so this is the you know kind of uh, variation you would expect and then we get another interesting results and all of this just by doing some you know multiplication and all that periglacial erosion it will decline exponentially at higher elevation and that would protect the highest elevation uh, you know once once the tectonic forces are strong enough to build them fast enough to build them or the when the uh, uplift rates are high enough to beat the highest erosion rates possible around this area then uh, above that the peak has a free run it can grow up to this uh, eight kilometer limit okay and similar things uh, you know has happened in uh, uh, on these where uh, active up uh, uh, uplift is going on and also in mount Denali, okay so I think uh, I would uh, have 
wanted to go to problem two, which would probably take you know five ten more minutes, but uh, I am not sure uh, about the time limit and so on. So, should we stop here? Sir, you can continue if you can finish it. Like you can take the time. Okay, so. I mean I can, but you know uh, there may not be much time to discuss and all. But anyway, let me tell you the next problem uh, where I uh, look at this problem that evolution of oyster and garden escarpment, and that's you know some of our friends. He was a mathematician, and uh, we had gone on a trek in Harish Chandragar. I don't know some of you is very close to Pune. I don't know if some of you have gone there or similar places. And this is Western Ghat escarpment, okay? So from that, there is a discontinuity. So here the elevation would be, I don't know, maybe 1,500 meters, and there would be 1,000 meter to more than 1,000 meter drop here. And these are the coastal plains. These are the Konkan plains, okay? And this is what is Western, Western Ghat. And uh, we had done some work related to its evolution. So I quickly go through that. And this is again a map of Western Ghat. And if you look at the elevation scale here, it's more or less zero. And here it's more or less 1,000 meters, okay? And that elevation change is happening over this western heart, heart which is, you know, just a line, essential, okay? So it's a very steep rise, and that's why it's called escarpment, okay? And just to highlight that, this is from this paper. I'll use data from this paper in the next slide. And just to highlight that, I have applied, you know, a age detection algorithm, which is nothing but calculate slope and plot the slope. And this is the plot of the slope. Let's look at it. You know, these are low values and these are high values. So you can clearly see that these pixels are lit up. That's because the slope there is very, very high, which you can also guess from this color contrast over here. Is this clear to you all? Should I move to the next thing? Yes. And this, you know, other thing worth mentioning is that this, you know, which is clear from here, that this is carp and runs all, almost all along this, you know, western coast of southern peninsula of India. And this is a you know, magical landscape. Not only you know when you go there and you know it's a beautiful place to visit, but also uh, geologically it's it's quite uh, one, you know, quite a wonder because this has been created in about 100 million years back, or maybe a bit less. Okay, but still it has retained its sharpness. So that's what a big you know is a big surprise because typically mountain ranges they their lifetime is. Once the tectonic uplift stops, their uh, lifetime is 100 kilo year. By then, they kind of erode away, diffuse away. Okay, but this has retained its sharpness over this 100 million year roughly time scale. So why is that? Okay, and what is it? What is happening to it right now? Is the question. And and uh, thanks to this paper uh, by uh, Mandel et al. Uh, so we have erosion rate measurements available from the escarpments okay and that when he when he had these measurements i am not getting into the detail how uh, did he measure it there's a lot of scatter but overall there is a clear dependence on slope so this is the mean slope of this catchment so these are catchment average erosion rates okay uh, measured using 10 beryllium uh, radiogenic uh, uh, cosmogenic nuclides okay and their concentration in sand and that tells us that, okay, approximately up to a lot of scatter, erosion rates are proportional to slope. And that, you know, uh, it, it takes a minute to convince yourself that that means these things are, this is a, a profile like this. Let's say this is the inland plateau and this is the coastal plains and this is the profile. And let's say so we start with something like this and all the places are eroding at some rate. And when uh, erosion rate depends on slope, so that then, you know, delta T is the erosion, and erosion rate is depending on slope, and this is the, you know, prefactor because slope is dimensionless, erosion rate is meter per year, so this would be meter per year, and this leads to an advection equation. And if it is an advection equation, you all know the solution is, you know, Z is a function of X minus UT. So this, whatever profile you have, it would maintain its shape, retain its shape, but only move like this and that's what is going on in western Ghat. and you know uh, again uh, just by fitting a straight line to this plot and realizing that this is a you know uh, advection advicting uh, object you know that uh, from the slope of this curve and the units are meter per million year you know that this line over here on the average it's moving inland at a speed of maybe 100 meter per million year okay 
sorry, per million years. So again, like that, you know, just uh, you using basic uh, uh, elementary maths and physics that we have learned uh, so far. All of you know all the maths that I've used today. It's just about going to a landscape and being aware of what's going on and uh, applying the having the courage to apply you know some simple multiplication and things like that and to gain some insight so again uh, that's what the theme that I thought I wanted to you know, emphasize throughout this, this talk and with that I will I think I'll stop yes so mind the maths physics chemistry and biology in the landscape around us and of course it it applies to any part of earth and climate science and if you want to read more about this you know, these are two very good books. And with that, uh, I will stop.